Hi, my name is Dave Kerr. I'm a curator in the Department of Film at the Museum of Modern Art. And I'd like to welcome you to this year's edition of Film Vault Summer Camp. As we did last year, we'll be looking at some of the more rare and curious items from MoMA's film collection, starting with an overview of some early color processes. There's quite a history uh, that leads up to the glorious spectacular we all know. And here to lead us through it is James Layton. Hi, I'm James Layton. I'm manager of the Celeste Bartos Film Preservation Center at the Museum of Modern Art. James is one of the world-class experts on this subject, and we are very lucky to have him working for us and with us here today. So James, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks Dave. Good. What are we gonna look at today, James? So the films we're gonna talk about today uh, are all made using different color processes uh, in the early years of cinema through to the 1930s. So the first film I wanted to talk about today is L'Entre Infernal, or The Infernal Cave, set in the, the depths of hell. So it uses what's called stop tricks or substitution splices, where it kind of adds, adds a sort of sense of magic. The actors film, they pause, they either add or remove something from the scene. You know, a puff of smoke comes and they start again, and all of a sudden something's there, you know, as if by magic. And the, the color sort of just enhances this sort of magical quality. That's a film we thought was hand colored, but it's probably more likely actually stencil colored, which looks similar in appearance to hand coloring, but it's a more mechanized automated process where stencils were used and within those areas, the colors were applied. So the dyes were added to a black and white film print. On the stencil for this film, they would have had to have cut the holes for each color that was going to be applied. This is uh, 300 feet long uh, with 16 images per foot. So that's 4,800 frames that had to be colored. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. Unbelievable. It's very laborious work. We also have a, uh, another example of stencil coloring we're showing in this series, um, La Voix du Grossignol, The Voice of the Nightingale, which comes 20 years later when stencil coloring had really been mastered and was at its best. It's made by master animator Ladislav Starovich, who was born in Russia. And he had a, a background in kind of natural history. He worked for a natural history museum and started his career as a filmmaker making documentaries about insects and things. As the story goes, he, he found filming beetle, the stag beetle fight under kind of studio lights actually killed the beetles. But he wanted to find a way to, to film these and he ended up animating them, animating the actual beetles, replacing their legs with, with wires so that they, you know, they could be articulated. Um, and he made a series of really quite charming films throughout the 1910s and, and 20s with animals, the birds. Uh, in this film, you'll see insects, you'll see little fairies he's created too. Really quite amazing animation for the time. And here we're seeing the, the colors applied, I think a bit more precisely than in the previous film we saw. The colors are kind of subdued. I think there was an attempt at more naturalism. Um, the little girl's hair is colored here. Some of the animated shots in particular uh, with the birds, with kind of the moon or the sunset look, look really quite natural. Color was actually fairly common in shorts throughout the 1920s. Technicolor sort of began to rise in prominence throughout the 20s. So our last film uh, in this program is a series of Technicolor tests made between 1933 and 1935-36 uh, by Pioneer Pictures. Uh, they're made using the, the three-color or three-strip Technicolor process. The reel starts with footage of Nan Sunderland, who was a, a Broadway actress, showing black and white and then and color as you know a contrast to see what, what more is added by color. As the reel continues, uh, there's other tests from The Dancing Pirate, and we see other tests with Dolores Del Rio, the star at the time, testing process photography, adding different layers to the image, live action, painted backgrounds, even stop motion animation. 
these tests, you know, they were a necessity in many cases. They had to test the lighting, they had to test the costumes, they had to test the sets, how you would print things. Of course, we remember Technicolor today for its, you know, this glorious Technicolor, three strip Technicolor, these musical extravaganzas, very gaudy and in your face. But that wasn't necessarily the case in the 30s. They wanted to ease this full, full color Technicolor in more slowly and they used more subdued palettes. We recently did a restoration of Nothing Sacred, 1937, and it has a very muted palette, right, Dave? Yes, it seems to have been a unique experiment, uh, trying to get away from the, the kind of garish uh, technicolor of the early 1930s. And it almost looks like a color wash more than a color film, very subtle. It was a direction that technicolor decided not to go in. And so color design for narrative expressive purposes became a thing at that point. You have people like William Cameron Menzies who really understood yeah, how to use the palette of color to create a mood, to put across an atmosphere. I always say that nobody set out to invent black and white silent movies. But always from the beginning, there were you know, a will to have color and sound and even 3D. I think these films demonstrate that color was certainly there from the beginning. Uh, audiences were used to seeing color. Uh, it was a creative tool for filmmakers. But there were always many challenges in achieving full, natural, realistic color. It didn't just happen overnight. There was kind of a path there through various different processes and techniques and, and technologies. It's important to recognize too that I think a lot of people first encountered silent films at their absolute worst. Dupes, you know, muddy, poor contrast, at the wrong projection speed. So a lot of people have a sense of silent film as being far more technically primitive than it, it actually was. And when you see the kind of work that James is doing, that Mama does in general, and returning the quality of those original images, it's really quite striking. They're quite beautiful. There's no reason to condescend to that work. And to me, that's that's the miracle of what we, what we do every day at MoMA, is to bring that stuff you know, out of the cave and back into the light and show you how gorgeous it was.